really the question that I think gets to all of us. Why are we alive? What's the purpose of being here? And last time we did share that it is important to have that answer from outside the universe itself. It's very difficult for any of us who are inside the closed system to answer that question effectively. It's like looking at a group of little flies on a massive balloon and asking them to answer the question, why are we here? It's hard for them to answer the question if they themselves are inside the closed system in which they exist. And really it is vital to get the answer from someone who is outside it. You remember we shared the need to find out if there was a creator who had put us here with some purpose in mind. And if we could possibly get in touch with that creator, it was vital to find out what purpose he had in mind when he created us. Then you remember last time we discussed the whole problem of finding out what that creator thought. And uh, we discussed the fact that many people were trying to tell us what the creator thought. Buddha tried to tell us what the creator thought, Muhammad, uh, Confucius, Zoroaster. And we felt that the only man who was really telling us what the Creator really had in mind when he made us was this man Jesus of Nazareth, who was born about 1900 years ago. You remember we talked about his historicity, whether he actually did exist. And it was vital for us before we made any move towards the Creator to know that this man Jesus did exist in the first century. And we discussed why you should believe the Bible and why you should treat it as reliable history and not just as some religious book with prejudices in it. And then we talked, you remember, of why we should believe that Jesus is the unique Son of God and the unique revelation of the Creator and is different from Muhammad and Buddha. And it seems to me, brothers, unless you really have come to that point where you are convinced inside yourself that Jesus did and said the things that the Bible says he did and said, and that this Jesus is for you God's unique son, unless you believe that, I don't see how you can talk about the experience of uh, becoming a Christian at all. It seems to me you have to be settled in your own mind uh, why you believe these things before you begin to go out on the limb of faith. Faith is twofold. It's belief and trust. You believe that certain things happened, therefore you decide to take the gamble and trust these things and give your life to it. What I'd like to share for a short time today is how you actually take the gamble, how you take the step that actually enables you to become a Christian. What did this man Jesus say was the reason we were created? Well, he put it in John 17 and verse 11. And, uh, I mean, you can look it up if, if you have a, a Bible. I'll just take the time to look these verses up. They are pretty important. John 17 and 11. Jesus said this, And now I am no more in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to thee. Holy Father, keep them in thy name, which thou hast given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. And Jesus, in praying to the Father, who is the creator of the world, prayed that we might be one, even as he and his Father were one. And Jesus implied that the reason we were created was to have fellowship with him and his Father. And that's the purpose God had in putting us on the earth. Now, Jesus' disciple John reinforced this belief because John wrote in 1 John 1 and verse 3, That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And John backed up what Jesus said was the meaning of life. He said, our purpose is to have fellowship with the Creator and with His Son, Jesus. And that, Jesus said, was the reason we were alive. Not to go through karma. Not to purify ourselves so that we would not have to return in continual reincarnations. Not even that we might make the world a better place. Not even that we might be good men. But that we might have fellowship with God, the Creator of the world. And that's why God made us. And that's why Jesus said it was vital for us to have the same kind of life that his father had. Uh, you can't have fellowship with a dog. 
because it's a different kind of life running through the dark. It's just extremely difficult to discuss, discuss predestination with a dog, and it's extremely difficult for him to really appreciate Bach's music, and it's very difficult for him to discuss how you feel about him or how he feels about you. You can't have fellowship with one another because it's a different kind of life that runs through both of you. Jesus said, you are made to have fellowship with me and my Father, so it's vital that you have the same kind of life running through you as we have running through us. And that's why Jesus repeated again and again that he had come to give us life and to give us life more abundantly. That his purpose was to give us that kind of life that he and his Father shared so that then we could have fellowship with them. We would have the same kind of life, the same kind of understanding as they had. You remember Jesus said in, oh, it was John 14, I think, in verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The way to enter into this life is to receive me, because I am that life. And I, I, I think that's true, brothers, that, that Jesus said that the reason we're here on, a, on earth is to receive him and his life so that we would become the kind of people that could fellowship with him and his Father forever. And uh, you remember Jesus said that that kind of life is given through a special person that he would send us. And it's John 16 and verse 15. John 16 and 15. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit. He says in John uh, 16 and 13, when the Spirit of truth comes, then he will take what is mine, the unique, uncreated life that I have, he will take from me and he will impart it. The Greek word for declare means impart or communicate it. He will communicate it to you. And that, Jesus said, is the great need that we men have and we women. We have to receive this new kind of life that enables us to be like him and his father. And it ties up, you know, with the whole story that we've often gone over together in Genesis. It ties up with the whole interpretation of Genesis. Jesus' big emphasis was not you must have your sins forgiven, but you must have your sins forgiven so that you can receive this unique life that my Father and I share. Now you may say, why should that be? Is it just because it's divine life compared with our created life? Yes, that's one reason. The life that we received at the beginning of the world was just natural physical life. That's the life, you remember, that God breathed into us when he breathed into his spirit, his spirit into us. And we became living souls. We became living psychological and physical beings with a capacity for this new uncreated life. But we were not given that new uncreated life. Instead, uh, God told us in Genesis that that life was made available to us in the tree of life. And you remember God put in the midst of the garden a tree of life. And God expected us to go and receive that new uncreated life from the tree of life voluntarily. And thence to be born into his trinity family. And that was God's plan for us. And really we missed the boat. We just refuse that uncreated life. So one of the reasons we have to receive the uncreated life is it is divine life. It's a different kind of life to this physical life that we have. This physical life will wear out after 70 years. We were never meant to go forever with this physical life. That's why when we come to 70 or 80 or 90, it dies out. It's God's way of showing us, look, the stuff that you have will not last you forever. It's only physical, mental, emotional life. It is not spiritual, uncreated, supernatural life. So one of the reasons we have to receive this life is so that we can live forever. But another reason is this life of God contains the very genes of God. Brothers, it contains the very qualities of God himself. It contains love, the fruit of this life that is at times called in the New Testament the Spirit, do you remember? In Galatians 5 and 22, the fruits of this spirit of uncreated life are described as love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Now, we are not like that naturally. 
our physical created life seems to make us self-centered, seems to make us envious and jealous, filled with pride, filled with striving to prove ourselves to each other, filled with restlessness. The reason we need to receive this new uncreated life is so that we will become like the Father and the Son. And that's been the frustration of countless religions, you know. They've tried to imitate the love of God, but they end up with a kind of philanthropy such as the humanists have that lasts for a while but not forever. Or they end up with a kind of peace that uh, Buddhism talks about when all it means is the negation of self. It means a kind of passivity. And all religions have been frustrated in this attempt to reproduce what only this uncreated spiritual life can produce. Now Jesus said to us, what you men and women most need is this uncreated spiritual life. And in fact, he taught his followers to preach that the big thing you'll receive when you are baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins is the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of that uncreated life. So the reason we're here on earth is really to become fit to live with God forever and enjoy his fellowship. And the only way we can do that is to be born of his Spirit. And that's why Jesus said, you know, you have to be born all over again. You and I have been born once of our fathers and mothers. And so, Mike, you have some of the, even I, though I've only met your dad once or twice, you have some of the characteristics, even your voice sounds like your dad's. And I have some of the characteristics of my father. And you have some of the characteristics of your mother and your father. And we are born of them, so we have their characteristics. To receive the characteristics of God, we have to be born of the Holy Spirit. So, brothers, really, that's the whole question. How can you be born of the Holy Spirit? Because that's what we need. We don't need to be good like God. That's not the need. We don't need to practice ethics to become like God so that he'll enjoy us. We need to be born of his uncreated life. And he says, I will send the Spirit of my Son into you if you are willing to be born of that Spirit. Now, how are you born of the Spirit of God? I think, first of all, we have to see what is our present state. Our present state, brothers, is the same as the state of Adam in the Garden of Eden. When he was offered, you remember, the uncreated life, it says in Genesis 2 and 7, you know, that God in Genesis 2 and 9, and out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When he was offered that tree of life, and he was warned by God of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall die. When he received that warning and that offer, you know what he did. In Genesis 3 and verse 6, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, that is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband and he ate. Adam and Eve decided to try to be good by their own understanding of good and evil. Not by receiving the new uncreated life of God's Spirit. And you and I have done the same thing. I mean, for all kinds of reasons, we have decided, well, we must try to be like God. So we must do our be best to understand good and evil and to avoid evil and to be good. And we haven't seen that that itself is the very heart of sin. Sin is not knowing good and doing evil. Sin is trying to be good just through having a knowledge of good and evil without God's Spirit. That's what sin is. Ordinary, downright sin is just deciding to try to be like God and to try to be good without receiving His Spirit. Because being good on your own is something that you can have control of. You can control being good. You can decide how good to be in this situation or how bad to be in that situation. But receiving his life is something that you have to depend on him giving to you. And that means you must be prepared to fulfill the conditions that he lays down without questioning them or examining them so that he can give you the life. And real sin, you see, the heart of sin is just a determination to be good without God. And that's why most uh, moralistic religions are really based on sin. 
They're an attempt to be like God without God's life. Now, it seems to me that's the first step we have to see. That what the Bible says is true, Romans 3 and 23, that all of us have sinned, and because of that have fallen short of God's glory. And all of us have determined to try to do it on our own. And there is within each one of us, you know, an attitude of sin that is kind of independent of God. We're prepared to do some things that he tells us to do, but we want to maintain our own independence at the heart of it. And we don't above all want to depend on something ephemeral like the gift of uncreated spiritual life to us. Because that means we have to depend utterly on him to give it to us. And we have to fulfill exactly the conditions that he wants us to fulfill. And so all of us have in some way, you know, developed inside us a subtle little independence of God. A subtle desire to do it on our own, to do it our way. And that's really the heart of sin. And it seems to me like, well, I've shared before, but that's what comes out in our man-woman relationships. That's what comes out in our homes. It's not so much the fruits of sin as the attitude of sin, the independent attitude to God, the desire to do it our own way, whatever anybody else thinks, that's what destroys our home lives. It's an attitude inside that shows up most when we're living together. Now, sin is basically an attitude. It's S and I, a big I. I doing it on my own without God's spiritual life. And that's really the heart of sin. And that's why God, you know, was so hard on the Jews at times, because they were trying to be good, to obey the law, without God's uncreated life flowing into them. When all the time God was saying, look, I don't want you to be good. I want you to be like me. I want you to be like me by receiving my life into you. So all of us really have sinned. Now, sin produces its fruits. I mean, if you have that attitude towards God and you refuse his uncreated spiritual life, then you end up really with the kind of attitude, you remember, that Eve uh, uh, saw she was going to receive from the knowledge of good, uh, good and evil. Uh, Genesis 3 and 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and we end up with lives that are dominated by the need for food, the need for clothing, the need for shelter. Sinful acts and thoughts and words usually follow the need for shelter and food and clothing. And most of us then live our lives coveting good food and gluttonous for good food. We uh, spend our lives greedy for good shelter and greedy for good clothes. And those are really sinful acts and thoughts and words, you see. But the heart of sin is the attitude. But when you don't have God's uncreated life flowing through you, then you spend your lives looking for good food and good shelter and good clothing. And ending up with the sinful acts and thoughts and words of covetousness and greed and possessiveness. Or, and that it was a delight to the eyes. We end up trying to find things that please us and delight us and make us enjoy ourselves. And if you don't have God's uncreated life flowing through you, you'll end up spending your life searching after enjoyment at anybody's cost. You know, you'll make a woman suffer so that you can enjoy yourself. You'll make your parents suffer in order that you can enjoy yourself. But you'll be dragged continually on trying to enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. And drugs and alcohol are just that kind of expression of a desire to enjoy ourselves. And that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. And you'll end up trying to prove yourself very bright and wise all through your life. And pride is a sinful feeling that comes from the lack of God's uncreated life flowing through us. So really, what Jesus says is, all of us have been living lives like that. We've had an attitude of independence to God's uncreated life, and because of that, we've produced sinful acts and thoughts and words. And of course, Jesus says, because of that, we're going to die. Each one of us is condemned to death, both because we lack uncreated life and because God said that. Listen, in Genesis 2 and 17, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, from the day that you eat of it you shall die. And really, all of us are under condemnation to death. We're dying now through lack of God's uncreated life, and we're condemned to an eternal separation from his presence, simply because we're not like him. If we went into his family with the created life that we have now, with all the covetousness and the jealousy and the anger that that produces, we would destroy his heaven. And so God has said, no, I must blot you out completely. Otherwise, you'll destroy what I have created. 
And that's really our situation, you know. And that's what Jesus says. You've all sinned. You've lived independent of my Father's life. And therefore you're condemned to death. And that, that, brothers, is why so many of us live with a sense of impending doom over us. After all, it's not because of the mushroom cloud. Sure it's not. Because all of us have a fair idea that the nations will not leash, unleash this on each other. They now know that they, anybody will be destroyed in a nuclear war. So it's not the fear of the mushroom uh, cloud. It's not the fear of war now. But there is a strange sense of impending doom over most people's lives today. There's a sense that something terrible is going to happen. And really, brothers, the heart of it is that angst is due to the fact that we're under condemnation to death. Now, you can see God is tied by his own word. He said we would die if we ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and refused his uncreated life. And he's tied by his word to keep that promise. And that's really the problem we have. God is tied to his own word and we are therefore in the place where he has put a flaming sword which has turned every way to guard the way to the tree of that uncreated life. So it's partly God's problem and it's partly our problem. We lack the uncreated life and he is in a position where if he's to remain just and righteous he has to keep his promise. And you know the only way God can change that is if someone will pay the penalty of our death that is due to his law of justice and righteousness. Only if someone dies in our place is God free to forgive us and yet to be sure that his righteousness and his justice are unquestioned in his universe. And that's what Jesus said happened. Jesus said, My Father loved you so much that he has given me his own son to die in your place. Or, you know, in, in Romans 5 and 8, it is God has commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that's what has released God into a position where he is free, really, to forgive us. That Jesus has died for us, and therefore God can say, All right, you see, I hate sin. I have kept my promise. Someone has died for this rejection of my uncreated life. And because my son has died, I can be sure that the world will no longer question my justice and my hatred of sin. And I am now in a position to forgive you men and you women. And that's the position we're in. God is ready to forgive us. But do you see what is needed? Brothers, we don't need our sins forgiven. God has already forgiven us. We need to receive his uncreated spiritual life. In other words, we need to be born of the Spirit. And I think here's where a lot of us fall short, you know. A lot of people today think when they hear Billy Graham or some other preacher preaching that all they need to do is believe. We just need to believe that Jesus has died so that we could receive the uncreated life of God. But we don't actually need to receive that uncreated life. And they kind of think that. They somehow make a distinction there and they say, all we've got to do is believe. doesn't matter whether we receive anything or not, we've just got to believe. Okay, I believe that Jesus has died so that God could forgive me and give me his uncreated life. But they never get the distance of receiving that uncreated life. Now, brothers, it is really different. Anybody can believe. Anybody can believe that Jesus has died for them. But that's not the issue. The issue is... Are you willing to receive the uncreated life that God is willing to give you because of that? It's a bit, I mean, I've used the illustration, I think, before with, with you men. It's a bit like me saying to Mike, okay, I'm up here, Mike, and I have $10, and I'll give you this $10 bill if you'll come up and receive it. And he says, yeah, I believe you, Pastor. I believe you'll do that. I believe you. You're a man of your word. I believe if I came up there, I'd receive that $10 bill. And then he goes off and doesn't receive it, and he says to Sue, let's go out on the $10 bill that I didn't receive from Pastor, but that I believe he would give me if I went up to him to receive it. Now, it seems to me a lot of us are living that kind of life. We believe that Jesus has died, and we believe that God is able to give us his uncreated life, but we have never taken the necessary steps to receive it. In other words, we are people who believe but have not received. We are people who are trying to reform our lives, 
because God has forgiven us our sins and we want to please him. But we are not people who have been born by, an uns- by a spiritual, uncreated life that God gives us through a supernatural work done in our spirits. Now, that's an entirely different thing, brothers. And it seems to me there are a lot of us running around who call ourselves Christians who are simply Christian believers. We're not Christian receivers. And we walk around with Christians and we believe all the things that Christians say, but we ourselves have not been changed inside. Now, if you say to me, all right, what are the steps, what are the conditions that we have to fulfill for God to give us this uncreated life? And the first step is just plain. Agree that you haven't got it. That's what Jesus really meant when he said, you remember, oh, I think it's uh, in 1 John uh, 1, and uh, I think it's about verse 9. If we confess, and we get caught up on the whole deal, you know, and get caught up on the idea of confessing to our priests and confessing to other people, but confessing is the Greek word, and it means raise your hand and agree with God. And the first thing you and I need to do is to agree that we haven't this uncreated life. Now, if you say, how do I know it? Okay, one way is uh, look at the wrinkles in your hands and look at your hair getting grayer and look at your body getting older. That proves that there's just created life going through you. Okay, look inside as well. <clears throat> the fruit of uncreated life will be inside you. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. Those are the fruits of uncreated life. If you have the other things running through you, those are the fruits of created life. And you remember they're listed in Galatians 5 and just a few verses before that, 22. Galatians 5 and 19, the works of the flesh are plain immorality, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, selfishness, dissension, party spirit, envy. Just look in and see, are those the fruits of life inside you? If they are, that's created life that you have running through you. What God says is the first step is to agree that that's your situation. If we could emphasize that you stop arguing with God. I mean, we're mad men. We keep on saying, oh, Lord, I am born of the Spirit. I know I'm born of the Spirit. I know I have a bit of envy or a bit of jealousy inside me, but I'm born of the Spirit. I know that. I better hang on to that. And what God is asking is, look, relax. Would you relax? Would you relax? If you have the symptoms of created life flowing through you, admit it. If you have the symptoms of uncreated life, admit it. You don't go to a doctor and say, Doctor, I feel weak and I I feel anemic, but I know there's nothing wrong with my blood. You don't. You say, look, I feel anemic, I feel weak. Now, is there something wrong with my blood? Now, that's what God is saying. If you have the symptoms of created life flowing through you, admit it. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive your sins. But the important thing is to cleanse you from all unrighteousness by giving you the uncreated life of his spirit. The first step is a thorough confession, brothers. I think it's really being honest with God. Really confess sins one by one as far as you can see them. Be honest about the things in your life that aren't like Jesus. Be honest about them. You know, even it seems to me, if we are Christians here this afternoon, there's a new influx of the life of Jesus if we are honest about some things that are present in our lives that we know aren't of God's will. There's just a new influx. When you come into a new brokenness today and you say, Yes, Lord, I agree. I'm not going to protest any longer. I'm not going to pretend any longer. This is the thing that comes up from my spirit. I can feel a real impatience at times that I cannot control. I can feel a real irritability, a real resentfulness that I cannot control. Lord, I admit that. I admit that's inside me and my spirit. Now, I know that that is not the kind of life that your Holy Spirit produces. Now, I agree. I confess that sin to you. That's the first step, brothers. A real confession. An honest agreement with God. Not just confessing the things that you want to confess. And then, you know, Jesus said, except you repent you will all likewise perish. In other words, even if you agree that you haven't uncreated life, if you don't turn from the symptoms in your life that are wrong, then you will still die for lack of uncreated life. And the second step is a real repentance. And brothers, I, I think we've, I mean, I think we've got weak 
and wishy-washy about what repentance is. I think we've thought that repentance is being sorry for our sins, or repentance is crying a lot, or repentance is being really fed up and exasperated by the mess we've got our lives into. And it's a kind of self-pity. But repentance in the Bible is not that. Repentance in the New Testament is metanoia in Greek. It's a change of mind. It's a real godly sorrow to the Father and to the Son for causing Jesus to be put to death. It's an outward thing, you see. It isn't a self-centered thing. I think a lot of people cry a lot, and they're really crying for themselves. They're crying for the emotional mess they're in. But real repentance is, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry that I caused your death. I'm sorry that I caused you to go to Calvary for the way I am. And I'm determined to turn from these things. And I don't know, brothers, you know, I think a lot of us say, oh, but, Pastor, you can't turn from them. You can only say you'll try to turn. No, God demands that you change your mind, that you say, Lord, I'm going to trust that you're going to give me your life after I do this. And I'm going to trust that you're going to give me the grace to live the way you want me to. And I turn from these things now, whatever it's going to cost me. I'm not going to make provision for that envy. I'm not going to make provision for the lust. I'm not going to make provision for the pride. I'm going to turn from these things now, whatever it costs me. And real repentance is a turning from the things that are wrong in your life. And it's a real making apology. I think a lot of us don't realize that in the old days, the evangelists (laughs) emphasized that you really make apology to people that you have wronged that you make restitution for money that you stole or, or things that you stole. And I think a lot of us have not received God's uncreated life because we haven't done that, you know. And we've left those things untouched. And we've held back from it because we didn't like the idea, we didn't like the suffering that it would involve. And I think what we need to begin to see is that God demands that we actually turn from those things and stop doing them, whatever it costs us. And trust him, you know, to make up for what we lack. And then the third step is really what Jesus said in Revelation 3 and 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. And the third step is a real receiving of the Spirit of Jesus. It's receiving the Spirit of that uncreated life. You may say, you know, well, how do you know that that spirit of uncreated life has come in? Well, it reproduces in you the whole life of Jesus. It makes you feel like Jesus inside. You find, instead of envy coming up in your heart, you find long-suffering and gentleness and humility coming up from inside. You find that you feel like Jesus from the inside. It's like a new person coming inside you. And I think it's vital for us to see that it's not through the peace that you feel. A lot of people say, oh, it's through the peace. You feel a great emotional peace. Some of us haven't felt a particular sense of peace. Some of us say, oh, it's through the great emotional sense of joy that you feel. No. Receiving the Spirit of Jesus is receiving something that comes as quietly as Jesus entered Mary's womb. And you know how quietly that was. Nobody could discover that something new had come into Mary's womb. Suddenly it just appeared. And it's like that with a person who receives Jesus into himself. It's just Jesus is there. There may be a sense of joy. There may be a sense of weeping. There may be a sense of peace. But really it's separate from all those things. It's just you know that there's a different person inside you because he makes you feel different about other people. You find a love coming out from you for other people that is different from the love you had before. And brothers, you would agree that that has happened with every one of us, every new brokenness we've come into. I mean, Jesus has come into us in a new way, and there's been a freshness and a vitality that wasn't there before. There's been a newness of life that is just different. And that's really uncreated life. And you can know, you can know that you're born of the Spirit simply by the kind of person you have become, you know. You have the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. If you're born of God, you don't sin. You don't willingly disobey God because he's your loving Father. You have only a spirit of love towards him. You want to please him with all your heart. It's Jesus in you that has this attitude to your Father. And brothers, I think every time we sense a different life coming into us, we must recognize that that is uncreated. That is created life that is flowing through us. That is the old independent life 
Whenever we sense any envy or any jealousy, we must get down and deal with God and really come into honest confession and real repentance and into a real receiving of Jesus' life. Then I think it is very important to see, you know, it is the marks of that spirit inside you that gives you assurance. I think a lot of us have been foolish about this. We've said, oh, well, you have assurance by the word. The word gives you assurance, you see. Because doesn't it say there, Revelation 3 and 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Now, did you open the door? I opened the door. Did Jesus come in? Jesus came in. And we often think that uh, assurance is a kind of brainwashing. Did you take the steps A, B, and C? Then God must have taken step D. Now, brothers, that is not assurance. That's kind of intellectual brainwashing, that you believe the right things. Some of us say, oh, well, you know you're a child of God because you have a kind of happiness about you. know, there are many non-Christians who have a good happiness about them because they're not afraid of hell and they don't fear God because they don't believe there is a God. And some people say, oh, well, it's because of the kind of company you come into or the kind of fellowship you have. No, the marks of a child of God are plainly laid out there, you know, in Galatians 5 and 22, 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, and joy and peace and it's a spirit it's a difference in your spirit it's your spirit is a loving spirit your spirit is a joyful spirit uh, it's a spirit of obedience a spirit that rejoices to obey the father if you want to know what a christian feels like inside he feels like jesus i mean jesus said did you not know that i'd be about my father's business my meat is to do the will of him that sent me my meat my food and drink each day is to do my Father's will. That's, I couldn't live without doing that. That's life for me. Now, when Jesus comes into one of us, that's the kind of spirit that comes out from us. A desire to do God's will, a rejoicing to obey him. His law is not heavy for us. It is not burdensome for us. Even when we come up against those things, you know, that you cannot control, that constant besetting sin that you cannot get hold of, and this I'd like to talk about, I think, next day a bit. But even when you come up against that, uh, your whole heart is against it. It is alien to you. You rebel against it. You say, no, I don't want that envy. I don't want that lust. I don't want that pride. Whatever it is, I don't want it. The whole spirit inside you rises against that to push it out. Because that's Jesus' spirit inside you. And so a child of God knows he's a child of God because, well, of Romans 8 and 16, you remember. Romans 8 and 16, where it says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. In other words, there are two witnesses inside a Christian that he's a child of God. His own spirit, with a small s, that is the spirit that bears the fruit of love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness. His own spirit that loves to obey the Father, that walks in obedience that walks apart from conscious di disobedience to God's will. And then there's the Holy Spirit that bears witness that Jesus has died for us and that we really believe that. Now, really, brothers, that's the heart, it seems to me, of becoming a Christian. And unless we come a new, through a new birth experience whereby God sends the Spirit of his Son into our spirits and into our hearts, unless we enter into that experience, we will not be born of the Spirit, and we'll find it impossible to live up to the words of the Bible. In fact, we'll always regard ourselves as trying to live up to the Bible, instead of finding that the Bible describes the kind of life we experience. And that's really the way it should be, you see. We should be finding that the Bible describes the kind of life that we're experiencing within. And if a person is really born of the Spirit, that will happen. Now, you know that countless people have not entered into that. Countless people are just believers. And you can tell they're believers because they're living disobedient lives. And they often have rebellion in their hearts. And they'll often say it again and again, well, I don't feel God. I don't feel him inside me. And they'll often, they won't act like children of God. You'll sense that they don't understand what you're talking about. They don't sense things the way Jesus senses them in you. So it's an inward spiritual assurance that you're a child of God. And the only way really to enter in is by that real confession and that real repentance 
and that real receiving of Jesus' Spirit. Just one last thing, you know, I remember when my wife uh, entered into the experience of the new birth, and there were just one or two things happened that I think it's good to know about because you yourselves might be trying to come into it or trying to help someone to come into it. And I remember there was a time when she did confess her sins and she did repent. And then I remember my friend asked her, now, have you received Jesus? Has he come into your life? And she said, no, no, I don't feel anything. And he said, oh, you're looking for a feeling. And she said, well, yeah, yeah, I suppose I am. Yeah. And he said, well, okay, well, it's not a feeling. It's not a feeling of peace or joy or weeping. It's just Jesus will come in when you know you've been honest with him. And so she sought God uh, uh, further. And then he asked her, well, has Jesus come in? And she said, well, I, I'm not really sure. And he said, well, you'll know when he comes in. And then, brothers, the important thing was he didn't try singing uh, into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, or try clapping on the back and saying, it's okay, sister, you're through, you know, even though you don't feel it. But he said, have you honestly confessed and honestly repented? And brothers, that's always the problem. If you cannot receive the Spirit of Jesus, it's because your confession has not been complete or your repentance has not been real. And so my wife got down, you know, to looking to see if she'd really confessed everything. And then she brought out some things in her attitude to me that God had convicted her about. And she confessed those and turned from them, and it was easy. She just, she, you know, it was amazing to me because it was my own wife and I knew her so well, but it was amazing when they, uh, my friend asked her, you know, has Jesus really come in? And she said, without any doubt at all, yes, he's come in. And it is interesting that it's a real transaction. It's a real, it's a real act of God that Jesus' Spirit comes into you when you're honest about your confession and your repentance and your readiness to give your life to them. And so it is a real act, a real supernatural work of God, the experience of the new birth. So really, you know, to those who may be listening to this later on, I would really ask them and counsel them and encourage them to enter into a real new birth and a real new birth of the Spirit and not just a reformation of life.